suffer as much as you guys. And, um, I'd like to pack it in too, but you know, we, we, we really have to, we, I don't want to, I don't want to um, cut, you know, I don't want to um, cut you short on the tarot. And um, there's so much to cover really that I haven't covered that I, I, I really need to, I mean, you don't have to cut, <laughs> that's your business, but uh, I really should be here, which reminds me, we should hand around a roll sheet, huh? Um, can someone just write it on the top of the date today in the name of the class, we'll just hand it around. Who's got a piece of paper? All right, you do. Um, so let's, let's keep moving. And uh, are you reading this on your own? Are you being able to read this at home a little bit? I mean, you say, well, what good does it do me to read it? Yeah, well, it doesn't do you a lot of good to read it. I admit that. But uh, it's a, a good first read for yourself helps. Then, you know, the more times you read it, the more intelligible it gets to be. And at the moment, I admit it. So, oh, we've got to the perfection doctrine anyway. So now, the walkers in perfection, we've heard they were attacked by the, uh, by those who sought smoothness. And they were with the uh, righteous one wherever he was. Uh, many have gone astray. Uh, war, great warriors stumbled. The watchers of heaven fell. Now that's something we, you wouldn't know about. But there is a book called the Book of Enoch that's in apocryphal literature that talks about the watchers. And uh, in modern language, the watchers are like uh, fallen angels, if you like. And um, they're sort of supernatural beings of some kind. And there's a whole watcher literature in the apocryphal uh, literature. Book of Enoch is the most famous one. There are other documents in the Dead Sea Scrolls that mention the watchers. But I don't think it's a terribly important thing that has to be known. <coughs> I'm just saying that that makes all this literature part and parcel of the same um, uh, complex of literatures. Enoch which I used to sign in this class, but I gave up. It's really too long and complicated, but you could read it if you're interested. You could even write a paper on Enoch if you wanted to. Anyway, um, fallen angels is probably the best way to think of the watchers of heaven fell. But they have to keep the commandments of God too. And uh, again, we read the letter of James, keeping the commandments is a big thing. If you break one small point, you're guilty of breaking it all. And then, of course, the flood is um, interpreted in this way. Because they were doing, line 20, they did according to their own will. They're very willful, stubborn. I think we're going to find that in the letters. Paul is very stubborn. The enemy in the scrolls generally is a stubborn person who follows his own will and does not keep the command. <laughs> anyway, dry land, uh, all flesh perished. And the wrath was kindled again. Then the, after that, the sons of Noah with their families, they went astray. Going astray is a constant thing. And therefore they were cut off. Cutting off is a, is a constant thing here. Cutting off is also something, again, I hate to keep blowing the parallels, but I think it's important. <coughs> Paul talks about people who want to cut off in Galatians. And it turns out the Essenes basically expel backsliders. That's a kind of cutting off backsliders. They cut them out, cut them off. And then he says, the people who are coming to circumcise you, he says uh, around chapter 5 of Galatians, I wish they would themselves cut off. And he's using the image to term in a kind of raunchy manner to talk about castration. Let them... Not only, I know they're trying to cut me off in terms of expel me or excommunicate me, but they're also trying to circumcise you. They're cutting your foreskins off, if you like. I wish they would themselves cut off. It's a double entendre, both on let them expel themselves, but also let them cut their privy parts off. I wish the knife would slip, I think he says at one point. Or I wish they would themselves cut off. He can get quite uh, uh, aggressive, but I, I'm interested in the word cutting off 
any parallels in language in the New Testament that I can uh, find, I'm interested to see if it has any, uh, any importance. But Abraham did not walk in them. Okay? He didn't. And therefore, here it is. He was made or called a friend of God. He was made or called a friend of God. That's in the letter of James. Because he kept the commandments of God. That's in the letter of James. And I'm finding parallels all the time. But I don't find parallels. I haven't read this in the Maccabee books. I haven't read this anywhere in Josephus. Only in the Christian literature do I find parallels. So for those who want to put this in 2nd century BC, they've got some, we'll talk about the archaeological and pedagraphic base of their arguments later on, but basically they're just doing external factors like archaeology, which I will explain and I do in Maccabees, really doesn't uh, make any, say anything convincing about when this was. And uh, paleography, study of handwriting, that too is a very imprecise science and can in the end, in my view, tell you very little. But then, aside from arguments of that kind, they don't make arguments on the basis of the data. And they don't even interpret the data correctly because they don't. They see these people as peaceful and I haven't seen any peace in them. And uh, they call them Essenes, but their concept of Essenes are a retiring apolitical group, but this is not a retiring apolitical group. In any case, it's a very aggressive group, and uh, it's very pro-commandments, pro-law, and uh, it uses a lot of the imagery we see in Christian letters by Paul and James. Let's go on. And he transmitted it to Isaac and Jacob, and they kept them the commandments. <coughs> Paul says that commandments didn't come to Moses this time. Therefore, what, how were people saved before that? He says they're saved by faith, like Abraham. But these people will say they had the commandments according to them. Abraham kept the commandments. Isaac, Jacob kept the commandments. And therefore, they too were inscribed as friends of God and heirs to the covenant forever. Paul speaks in his letters about being heirs to the promise. Sons or children of the promise. When he's talking about Abraham. And he said, we are the children in Galatians and Romans of the free wife, meaning Sarah, not of the slave wife, Hagar. And it means by slave wife, the people are slave to the commandments. It's, it's a euphemism. It's a, it's an allegory that he gets from a uh, Philo type argument in Alexandria, the rhetoric, where he allegorizes things. He says such things are allegory. This is in chapter 4 of the book. So, um, <coughs> for him, slavery is slavery to the law. So, over and over again, he shows that he's totally against this mindset. These people are always for keeping the law, keeping it. Paul, that's slavery. And therefore, they are inscribed as friends of God and heirs of the covenant forever. So this book, they're friends too. Now, in Islam, has similar ideology. And Islam calls uh, Abraham a Muslim. He says he's the first Muslim and he was a friend of God. And Abraham in Islam is called Al-Khalil, the friend. So they're operating in the same uh, tradition. And he says, Isaac and Jacob, they surrendered, therefore they were Muslims. And everyone surrendered were Muslims. Muhammad is using the word Muslim the way these documents are using the word friend of God. Muhammad has uh, picked up some of these traditions, but it's seven centuries down the pipeline. <coughs> at least five, if not six, anyway. And uh, he's uh, presented it slightly according to his own spin, shall we say. But the terminology, I think, links up here. Friend here is Muslim in the Quran. 
And their sons walked in stubbornness of God and God. And then in Egypt, well, what's that? That's the exodus, that's the period of slavery in Egypt. And they complained against the commandments of God. Everything is based on, you know, keeping or complaining or opposing the commandments of God. Everyone agree with that? The whole history is being told very quickly of the Bible. Each man doing what was right in their eyes. And what else did they do? Second time, they ate blood. That is, if you see now in this document, you'll agree twice a total no no. Everyone agree with that? And that's why they were cut off in the wilderness. Cut off again. But now I admit the guy writing this is not a necessarily nice fellow. He sounds like the Ayatollah Khomeini or somebody. But uh, in any case, uh, he means what I think. He means what I think. <coughs> not elegant like that Paul is, but just because a person has a, a silver tongue doesn't mean that he, he means well or that he's a righteous person. I think this person means to be righteous. I don't think anyone would disagree with that. Okay, now, he's not going to lop off people's heads. No, he's not like that. He saw them off with a knife, like our friends in the Middle East do. <laughs> Okay, and then blame us for killing one soldier. I'm killing one one uh, person, maybe uh, you know, in the heat of battle. And then meanwhile, they're sawing off heads right and left, and never blame themselves at all. And our own journalists run around pounding us and making us like fools around the world. It's, it's disgusting. We should start getting people who are giving aid and comfort to the enemy sometime. Uh, back into the uh, back into the lexicon because these people are doing American great harm. Anyway, forget all that. Let's go back here. These people are not selling people's heads off. <laughs> My anger today. Okay, I apologize. <laughs> I don't like watching this stuff. <clears throat> and I certainly don't like watching the news people, though I watch them quite often. And um, they complained, and they ate blood, and their males were cut off in the wilderness. They quote some scripture from Deuteronomy here. By the way, when did they eat blood in the wilderness? Do you remember the episode anyone knows the Bible? Well, some quail flew in. And they ate the quail because they were hungry or something like that. But the Bible doesn't condemn them for that. Only later on, one of the Psalms, I think, said condemns that. Anyway, there's a mixed presentation. You look in a concordance of the Bible, look up quail, and you'll find that in some places it's looked upon as a blessing of God, and in other places it's looked upon as something they shouldn't have done. <laughs> They're picking up they shouldn't have done it. Interesting, huh? So it's the quail episode anyway. I, I, by the way, I've been down in the Sinai area and when I was much younger, your age, and uh, driving and things, and I've seen quail down. What happens is in winter storms, they get blown off the Mediterranean, and you really do see them, you know, running around there. It's really interesting. They get blown in from the storms of the Mediterranean. Um, okay, so now we're going to go and possess the land, land but uh, they still kept doing according to their own spirit and the wrath of God, and they murmured in their tents, murmuring against Moses here. The liar murmurs against the righteous teacher in the community rule. And the wrath of God was kindled against their whole assembly. Again, congregation, assembly, church, whatever. And their sons perished. Now we're speeding up the history, aren't we? We've speeded up the uh, video machine. We're going fast forward. And now we're really rushing. Because we've finished the exodus, haven't we? And uh, because of that, kings were cut off. We're up to the kingdoms of Israel and Judah. And cutting off is still now really important. <coughs> Mighty ones perished, and the land became desolate. And they were delivered up to the sword because they deserted the covenant of God. This is a real preacher, isn't it? So this is the end of the first temple here, Paul. Right? 500 years of this has come by, guys. And uh, this... Because the members of the covenant of the first sin, or the ancestors, sinned and were delivered up to the sword, the first temple. And the reason again is the same always. They chose their own will, followed their own stubbornness, each after their own heart, each man doing, doing according to his own will. However, 
Now here's the good God. Holding facts, that's the thing. Holding facts. Those who held fast to the commandments of God, those that were remained, or the remainder, or the residue, God established his covenant with Israel forever. They haven't lost hope of this group. Revealing to them the hidden things concerning which all Israel went astray, and he opened up for them his holy Sabbath, his glorious festivals, the testimonies of his righteousness, and the ways of his truth, and the wishes of his will. So this people, this group likes the, uh, the festivals, right? And the, everything like that. Let me tell you, I'll show you how Paul talks about that kind of thing in Galatians. So just to show you how much opposed these kind of mindsets are, he says, uh, in chapter, uh, I think, uh, when he's talking about slavery, before he gets to uh, the Jews being the children of Hagar at Mount Sinai in chapter 4, he says, Because you are sons, God sent the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son and an heir of God through Christ. But then, indeed, not knowing God, you are a slave to those who by nature are not God's. This is his uh, Greek rhetoric where he goes thesis, antithesis, and then uh, synthesis. Use the same language and kicks it back and forth. He does this very often. Uh, but now, <coughs> people don't know Greek rhetor rhetoric training are like awestruck by this kind of uh, rhetorical presentation. Like, oh my God, what's he talking about? It's beyond my comprehension. It's a style of rhetoric that he's mastered very skilled, trained person in Hellenistic repartee and rhetorical argument. But now that you have known God, or rather you have been known by God, well, I'll go back to that. But then indeed, not knowing God, you were a slave to those who by nature are not gods. But now that you have been known, known God, or rather you have been known by God, how can you turn again to the weak and poor principles to which you again desire to be enslaved? The weak and beggarly playing off the poor, the Ebionites. You carefully keep the days and months and times and years. Those are the weak and poor and beggarly principles to which you wish to be enslaved. I'm not saying it's wrong. I just want to show how totally 180 degrees the opposite of these people he is. I'm afraid that somehow I have labored to no avail regarding you. I've wasted my time with you. You, you. you people understand nothing. I could go on. That's in Galatians uh, 4, 9, and, and that area. But for these people, right? And he revealed the hidden things which all Israel went astray. He opened for them his holy Sabbath, his glorious festivals. Testimonies of his righteousness, the ways of his truth, these are what the things that I think Paul is calling the beggarly and poor principles to which you are enslaved. You keep the times, the seasons. Am I wrong? That's a similar subject. Think about that and you'll decide for yourself. And uh, the ways of his truth and the wishes of his will, which a man must do, 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 be a doer now in James, be a doer of the word in order to live through them. You're going to live. You live through Christ. No, here you live through doing. And doing is based on the word works. This is how you're going to live. <coughs> and they mean live. And now we're getting some real <coughs> stuff. And they dug a well rich in waters. We're going to hear about the, the well that they dug in column six. Or esoteric, but the well is the well of living waters in the new covenant in the land of Damascus, where the new covenant is revealed to them. But those rejecting them, they shall not live. Paul talking about living in Christ Jesus, they're talking about living through the well of living waters and through doing. But they immerse themselves, these people who rejected these commandments and other things in sin or punishment and the ways of all pollution and uncleanness. When they said this is our sin or our way, 
But God and his marvelous mysteries atone for their sin. We have atonement for sin, remission of sin. John preached remission of sin in the wilderness, same kind of thing. Atoned for their sin and forgave them their iniquities, forgave them their sins. Marvelous way God could do this. To my mind, that's what the New Testament is talking about in terms of preaching remission of sins. Now what does God do? He built for them a house of faith in Israel. Paul speaks about building, being an architect in 1 Corinthians 3.9, which is why I mentioned it. it. talks about a house. <coughs> but they're talking about, as we'll see, a house based on the Torah later on. But in any case, that has never stood from ancient time until now. Again, holding fast is important, and those who hold fast to it. Have you got a pen I can borrow? I want to circle this. Anyone got an extra pen or something? Yeah. Can I borrow one of yours? Ooh, ooh, ooh. Got to hold my book out there. Thanks a lot. I want to um, I want to circle wherever I see hold fast because that's going to become. Where was the previous one where we just had uh, hold fast and a moment ago? Oh, here it is, line 12 of the previous. Those who hold fast to the covenant of God. Holding fast is going to be a very important uh, ideology here. For them there will be, as I translated, maybe you have a different translator, victorious life. What do you have? Huh? Go ahead, what do you have in... Uh, no, I, I have victorious life. Oh, that's what, yeah. yeah. Who has the, the mesh translation? What do you have there? Those that hold after the house that will never stood from ancient times. End of column three. Live forever and all the glory. What? Live forever and all the glory. No, that's um. Which part? Well, he doesn't say that, but uh, anyway, okay. In all the victorious life, okay, live forever in all the glory. Doesn't say that. But that's <coughs> that's an attempt to render what he means. There will be okay eternal life, maybe. And all the glory, yeah, and all the glory of Adam will be theirs. Which God established for them by the hand of the prophet Ezekiel. Okay, so it looks like they're going to be live eternally if they hold fast to this house of faith. And the glory of Adam is something like in the Ebionite religion I've been emphasizing in other work, but maybe I haven't spoken enough about here. They have an idea of the primal Adam, the first Adam, and Jesus is the second Adam for the Ebionites. And in fact, if you look at Paul in the end of 1 Corinthians, he said the, uh, the first Adam is the man out of the dust, the second Adam is the Christ out of heaven, and so on. He knows the primal Adam. And I think that's when they speak about the glory of Adam. They mean this sort of Adam that is uh, reincarnated as the Christ or the Messiah. And it's often mentioned here in several contexts. Here we'll get it in the war scroll, we have it here. But well, that's an interesting concept. I, I, I noted there. I'll also give you the 1 Corinthians uh, passages that parallel that. Now we move over and come forward to this very important uh, prophecy from the prophet Ezekiel, Ezekiel 44:15. And it quotes it here because it seems to be saying all this is explained in Ezekiel 44.15 which in common parlance among scholars is called the Zadokite Covenant. The Zadokite Covenant. So uh, here we have the Zadokite Covenant. It's in the end of Ezekiel where he's talking about the new temple where God takes him by the Spirit and lets him down in Jerusalem and he measures out the new, uh, uh, the new temple and then he says um, uh, who's going to serve in it. And, he, and, he, and, he, and this is the quote something of like, Ezekiel's a very important prophet for these people. Um, the priests and the Levites and the sons of Zion kept the service of the temple when the sons of Israel strayed from me, this is what he says supposedly, in <coughs> this Ezekiel 44, will offer me the fat and the blood. In other words, will do service at the altar. But this is going to be interpreted now in an esoteric way. 
That is not in a normal way. First of all, the, pro the quote from Ezekiel is not as written here. There's no and between the priests and the Levites. They have actually put that in in this document because they want to interpret these, these uh, as different quantities, as different groups. So the actual quote from Ezekiel, which is very difficult to translate, says, the priests who are the sons of Zadok Levites, in other words, Levites who are sons of Zadok, the priests who are, you know, Levites descended from Zadok. That's what it really says. It doesn't have three different groups. They're all one group. But now, because they want to speak about three different groups here, they split it open with ands. So let's take some liberty with scriptural text here. You following me? So they say. The priests, the Levites, okay. Now, the interpretation is, so this is what's called in our language, come on over the board, not too comfortable. Pesher, P-E-S-H-E-R, which means in Hebrew, the interpretation. Pesher is like a commentary. So it doesn't say Pesher here, but that's what they're doing here, a commentary. And in the Peshers, the commentaries, it says Pesher Ro, its interpretation is. Its Pesher is. Its interpretation is. Anyway, so here's the interpretation. The priests, and I told you to watch that thing, earlier, are the penitents of Israel. We met the penitents from Israel before in the column 2, didn't we? Or column, end of column 1 or beginning of column 2, didn't we? The okay, now, sin. what? The penitents the from sin, but they were doing something anyway. You'll check that. They're the penitents of Israel, and what did they do? They went out from the land of Judah. They left. Exodus, re-exodus from Judah. And they're using archaic language, land of Judah. They probably mean what we would now call in a Mel Gibson movie, Judea. Who we went out from Judea because we're in the first or second century BC or AD here. So there's no land of Judah anymore. <coughs> it's Judea or something like that. But anyway, land of Judah would be an archaic way of expressing it. And the joiners with them. Literally it says, and Ramesh does not have this translation correctly, and the Nilvim with them. It doesn't say that the Levites are the Nilvim, which he put there, I think, are the joiners. You see, he's adding language. Because obviously they're talking about the Levites, but they're using a word in Hebrew based on the same root as Levite. The word Hebrew, in Hebrew, Levite, which is the lower priest class of the temple, as you probably may know, is to be joined to, to be connected to. When you say nilvim, it's a noun meaning joiners. And it's a play, as I say here, on the word Levites in the original text. I, in my work, as you'll see if you read my all my stuff there, if you don't, it doesn't matter, I say this is a cadre of Gentile associates with the community. You see, the priests are the penitents of Israel. That, 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 that's not a normal uh, genealogical priesthood. That's an esoteric priesthood. That's not based on blood or anything like that. They're just people in, uh, from Israel who have had remission of sins. They're what we're going to call priests in this prophecy or this presentation. The Levites, they're not normal Levites. They're the associates, or the associated group, the Nilbim, who went out with them. Why do I say that Nilbim were Gentiles? Well, in the prophet Isaiah, the word Nilbim is used, and it clearly means Gentiles. And in Esther, the book of Esther, it's quite clear that the Nilbim are people who join themselves to the Jewish community who are from a non-Jewish background. So in my work, I have, uh, that's why I insist on uh, an absolute tr translation I think there's indications here as we go that there are Gentiles associated with this community, non-Jews associated with this community. 
and the priest is not a normative priest. So that's the Nilvim. And the sons of Zadok now, it's another third corner you see, there's three different groups. They're not just any old people, they're the elect of Israel, called by name. And what are they going to do? They will stand up or go on standing or function or, 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 or you know, <coughs> functioning in the last days. So we're getting to the last days here. Where do we hit the last days first? In the prophet Daniel, I think. Christians are very interested in the last days. Did I ever hear the back of books talk about the last days? No, not to my knowledge. So the last days, again, is a first century sort of uh, interest. I don't know if it ever existed much before then in terms of people really being interested in All the material in this document points to the first century to me, contemporary with what we would call early Christianity. So that's just my view from internal evidence, not the external evidence. I'm not basing it on false pedagraphical sequences. I'll tell you, so what's wrong with a fault with a pedagraphical sequence is you can, as I've said in the Maccabees book, you can have two writers, uh, scribes, sitting side by side. One with uh, who was, uh, has an archaic handwriting style, one who has a very new and innovative handwriting style. You can even have, make it for the purpose of argument that the uh, old uh, scribe was 80 years old, the other one was 25. And you can even say that the old scribe had very conservative teachers and the young scribe had very uh, innovative teachers. And suppose they sat there and copied a manuscript at the same time. What date would you give to those two manuscripts? Well, you could be out 100 or 200 years. Just judging on if you said, if you could identify when the handwriting style came from. They can't even do that. Or they say there was a straight line development of scripts. That's just their assumption. In my Maccabees books, I say, well, straight line development of scripts in this period. Cross is the one who did this with another uh, scholar called Birnbaum, S.S. Birnbaum. I don't want to be rude or crude here, but I sometimes call him bird brain. But, uh, you know, he, he, uh, the reason I call him bird brain or bird, bird bound is fine is because his mathematics, his schoolboy equations <coughs> of development of scripts are so childish. You have so many variables here. The age of the scribe, the excellence of his writing, where he was trained. So if you want to, you, you don't have a straight line equation here of a development in terms of, you know, uh, um, what factors are influencing the script style. I say that you have a differential equation here that would tax the abilities of a space engineer to solve with multiple variables. And this guy is using a, a, a schoolboy, junior high school straight line equation. Now, you know, with the lack of a critique, and that stands when you have um, scholars that basically follow each other like lemmings, but it doesn't stand up when someone criticizes it. So there it is, there's the critique right there. No one's ever answered that critique. The paleography is not certain by any means. It, it's good as long as it helps. But if it, if, it, if it gives you a result that is questionable, then you have to uh, abandon it. And if it conflicts with the internal evidence, then you certainly have to abandon it. One of the things that is clear is that most of these documents using these allusions are written all about the same time. So if you've got one in a so-called late handwriting style and one in an early handwriting style, the handwriting isn't telling you anything about when these documents were written, only that you have a conservative scribe vis-a-vis -vis, uh, um, a non-conservative scribe. Or that the two manuscripts were copied in different places. A famous scholar by the name of Morton Smith, who died um, not long ago, but he had spent a lot of time in monasteries, particularly in Sinai and in Manathos in Greece, and in Manathos in Greece, he said what was interesting to him is he saw handwriting styles by scribes are very conservative and they don't change over, over long periods of time. And he saw multiple handwriting styles among different scribes functioning side by side in this monastery in Manathos, Greece. So again, you could ask the question, what date would you give a manuscript copied by several of these different scribes using widely differing uh, uh, scripts of origin. It's, uh, paleography, even if you could get, a, get a, a straight line equation, I think it's more like a zigzag equation that you, know, you might get. And they have a straight line development of scripts. No, that's not the way it works. Uh, but anyway, 
in the best of times, it might. So it, 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 if it can help you, fine. But where it, uh, where it is, uh, is um, in conflict with the internal evidence, what the texts themselves say, and the illusions in the text, like make a straight way in the wilderness, if I see a text using make a way straight way in the wilderness, and I have a parallel in the New Testament to that use of that scriptural passage, then that looks like a first century text to me. If someone is saying that's a second century BC text uh, based on handwriting style, then I say that he may be wrong. Particularly if that text has other things like baptism, Holy Spirit, a lot of other things in it. It all looks first century. So, you know, you have to um, take the um, the uh, handwriting uh, matter with a grain of salt. So, um, all things being equal, if the internal evidence is at odds with these external things like paleography, then the internal evidence must be the determining factor, to my view. I may be wrong, but that's the argument I put in the Maccabees book. Uh, so, um, so you have here. Um, we're talking about. Standing in the last days. All these texts use allusions like that. So to my mind, they're all written around the same time is what I'm saying. So I don't care what, if the different scribes are, are writing it, uh, and the handwriting looks different, and, and a person like Ross says, oh, well, the second century BC handwriting, so it must have been second century BC. It doesn't say anything. Because all a handwriting style tells you is that a person using that style didn't use that handwriting style before it was developed. It doesn't tell you how long after that handwriting style became standard a person used it. So even if you say, if you could say, and you really can't, that this handwriting style developed in the second century BC, it doesn't say that a scribe couldn't be using it in the first century A. Because these styles are, are very stubborn, notoriously stubborn. And as I said, Smith in Athos, Greece was seeing styles from multiple varying periods of um, development side by side, being used by scholars. And uh, so that's uh, very difficult to base things on pedagogy. It only works for lack of a better uh, measure. And I think most people doing that don't wrestle with the internal material. So let's look at the internal material some more. Okay, so. These sons of Zadok now are the elect. We're going to have that again in the Habakkuk commentary. And they're going to stand in the last days or go on stand. Again, like in the second column, the exact exposition of their names, their generation, the errors of their standing, the number of their sufferings, the years of their existence, the price ex exposition of their works. And the text is a little bit um, corrupted here, so we don't know exactly what it's saying, but they are the first men of holiness or something like that. And we read this before, for whom or through whom God made atonement. So God either made atonement for them or they made atonement for others like Jesus. And they justify the righteous and condemn the wicked. And all those coming after them are to do. Do, 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 do. <coughs> According to the precise letter of the, it says Torah, by the way, not law. Of the Torah. And therefore you know that the first are transmitting the Torah, which the first transmitted the ancestors, the forefathers, until the completion of the era of these years, according to the covenant which God made with the first, the ancestors. Now we're getting to understand what the first column meant. It's the law and the Torah to atone or forgive their sins, so too good God would make atonement for or through them. And with the completion of the era, the number of these years, this is an interesting point, there will be no more joining to the house of Judah, but at, rather each man will stand upon his own net. <coughs> it looks like a corruption there. It could mean watchtowers, I put in parentheses. And we'll see in the Habakkuk commentary, Habakkuk 2.1, that it says, take your stand on the watchtower and look out. God tells the prophet. And it's um, one letter different. So it could be a scribal error there. I don't know what the new fragments have said about that. I don't know if we have a parallel in the new fragments. Um, let's go back to the sons of Zedon. To my mind, it's something like what Paul says at the end of uh, 1 Corinthians. Not everyone uh, will go into the kingdom of heaven dead. In other words, some will go into living. 
the sons of Zadok are uh, Zadok is based on the same usage as righteous one. Zadok was also the high priest of David's first temple. They can be considered the, uh, the descendants of uh, that priest, or they can be called the sons of righteousness. I think what we're really talking about is the kind of sons of righteousness here, uh, making a code to agree with Ezekiel as sons of Zadok. So if you want to call these, remember we said Zadok is the basis of the usage Sadducee, remember we said that? If you want to call these a kind of Sadducee, they're righteousness oriented Sadducees. There are Sadducees, if you like, who do not make necessarily a genealogical requirement for the priesthood. But they do make a righteousness oriented requirement for the priesthood and a keeping the covenant requirement. So righteousness, keeping the covenant, are all part of what they do. And they justify the righteous, you see, and they condemn the wicked. So to my mind, what's being talked about here is the last days, and if you like, in Christianity, going into the kingdom of heaven. The righteous dead have to go in, and that's where the standing or standing up comes into play. Standing can also mean resurrected, as the prophet Ezekiel said that the bones stand up. The standing up of the bones. So standing up in the last days will be some sons of Zadok, who we already know all about them and their sufferings and what happened with them and their works. That's already known, you see. That's past history. They're going into the kingdom dead and they'll be resurrected. But the righteous living, they're going to go in like the people of the rapture thing. <coughs> Nowadays, there's people in the rapture you may know about or heard of them, and they, they're all getting ready to go right in, aren't they? There's two groups, two streams. All of them are sons of Zadok, the righteous living and the righteous dead. Okay, now, that's what I think that means. If you have a better explanation, fine, let's go on then. But, in each point here, there'll be no more joining to the house of Judah. It looks like they're saying, the house of Judah is just an archaic way of saying Jews. It looks like they're saying that there's, when this is all sorted out, it's somewhat like Christianity is saying. There's not going to be any more Jews as such. There's just going to be righteous people and non-righteous people. You're not going to have tribal affiliations. But you will have the commandments. And you will have righteousness. Okay? Let's go on. But each man, you see, will, will, will stand on his own watchtower. And be judged probably according to that. Now a new image. Very important. And uh, this is because, as Micah said these things about the fence, and then in those years, here's a new thing to talk about and discuss. Billy. Billy. Billy was raised up. Paul speaks about Billy or Billy are in two Corinthians. Has it wrong? He, there's a <coughs> error there. He, really he says in 2 Corinthians 6 something, what does Christ have in common with Belial? So he knows Belial. Belial is their word for the devil. In fact, our word for the devil comes from Belial. As it goes into Greek, becomes diabolo. You have the bolo in there, and it's to throw against or something, but it's based on the bilial usage. In the Quran, it's iblis, I B L I S, uh, which is also B L. In um, linguistics, two letters are sufficient to establish a loan. So if you've got BL, and you have it in other places, variations of it, Billy R, Diabolo, Iblis, Belial, Devil. Just change the B to a B, and you've got Devil, Billy. <laughs> uh, two word letters in common is, you know, people mess things up all the time. Look, you want to see how things get messed up? Look at, uh, Constantinople and Istanbul over oral usage. Constantinople. 
Strobo, Strobo, Stembo, Stembo, Istanbul. That's how, that's how it goes. That's how, you know, take Nablus, Nablus in Arabic, the city of the West Bank. I told you something about that again. Nablus comes from the Greek Neapolis. There's no B, there's no P in Arabic, only a B. So they go Neapolis, 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 Neapolis. Same as Baba, Haji Baba is Papa, Pope. This is how what happens in oral language. I know Arabic and Hebrew so much, so I can give you the example. So I'll give you another example. Um, you've heard of the word, um, very famous allusion, um, Andalusia. So the, the word for Spain, the Knights of Andalusia, the romantic guitars playing, you know, Al Andalusia, you know, music. Spanish guitar. It comes from, in North Africa, the Romans sent the Vandals down through Spain to North Africa. So when the Arabs came across North Africa, they asked the people there, what was that land called over there? Well, that was the land from which the Vandals came. So therefore, in Arabic, it became all Vandals, all Vandals, all Andals, all Andalus, and in English, Andalusia. That's how words move from language. So when I say, and I, I'm not kidding, devil, devil, billial, you know, that, that, that is definitely true. That's what happens. Anyway, billial is the devil. And literally. Uh, so, billial sent against Israel as God foretold by the hand of the prophet Isaiah. Panic, snare, net are upon you, O oh, inhabitants of the land. Okay, again, it's interpretation, getting interpretation of scripture, concerns the three nets of Belial, about which Levi, the son of Jacob, that's another apocryphal work we know. The Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs, each patriarch, Levi, Judah, you know, um, Benjamin, and so on, give a testament. We found some of them at Qumran. Testament of Levi, we found fragments of, but not completely. Anyway, there's a book we have from Christian apocryphal collections called The Testament of Levi, and he does speak about the nets of Beli. Uh, if you look at Revelations, you'll find that it is Balaam set a snare to entrap Israel. Beli and Balaam, same, loan words. The Bala is sufficient. Revelation is full of this. Uh, in fact, Babylon. Is another one. Beelzebub is another one. All variations on the same word. Billy. Uh, I can read you that in, in Revelation some other time, but it's there about Balaam setting a snare for Balak. Balaam set a snare for Balak, and so on. That's exactly what we have here. To catch Israel, transforming these things, that is, the nets into three kinds of righteousness, these evil things. That, these are the snares to entrap Israel. Now, to my mind, here's where we can date this document. From this, what seems like a totally stupid, uh, you know, illusion, right? Innocuous illusion. The first is fornication. The second is riches. And the third is pollution of the temple. It doesn't tell us a lot until we get to how they define these fornication, riches, and pollution of the temple. And this is where we can find that we're in the Herodian period. Because fornication is going to be defined as incest, um, polygamy, and in particular marrying nieces. And now we know that that's what the Herodians did as a matter of family policy. So these, uh, what seem like, um, and there's no indication the Maccabeans did that as a matter of family policy. Occasionally, maybe they did some Anyway, these things are forbidden by the uh, Damascus document. And also that other documents that come on. Uh, the Temple Scroll has the same thing. It goes further. It says the king is to marry one wife and one wife only during the time of his life. Herod married ten wives. And she is to be Jewish. Herod, many farm wives. 
all Herodians marry their nieces. We get Herodias marrying uh, two uncles. John the Baptist complains about it, and on and on it goes. Her uh, niece married her brother. So we get another niece marrying an uncle. I gave the genealogies uh, in the back of my James Brother of Jesus book, and you can see all the niece marriages there in the Herodian genealogy. Anyway, he who escapes the first is caught in the second, he who escapes the second is caught in the third. The builders of the wall, which is another important allusion from Ezekiel, which we had a little earlier when we were talking about allusions and preaching allusions. These builders of the wall, the daubers on the wall, the plasterers on the wall, <coughs> discussed a little bit earlier. Again, Ezekiel 13. Who followed Zozo, so and so, not willing to name who it is. The spouter, or he is a spouter, spout of lying, about whom Micah said he will surely spout. That's where the spout of lying comes from. Hit teeth, the same as pouring out, are caught in two of these. One, fornication, because they take two wives in a lifetime, in the same lifetime of their you know, husband, whereas the foundation of creation is male and female, he created them. It's not a very strong argument, but uh, you know, animal fun, male and female, they go around doing all kinds of funny things. So. But anyway, it's the best they can muster. <laughs> These are not geniuses here. They're just doing their best. And regarding entering the ark, two by two they went into the ark. So they get wherever they can, this, uh, you know, two by two being the right order of the universe. So they want monogamy, which we know in Christianity is an important principle. And as for the ruler, or the Nazi or prince, it is written, and he shall not multiply wives unto himself, Deuteronomy. But we know that David did. But now they're saying David had not re read that book of the Torah. Deuteronomy, he wasn't found long after David's lifetime. There was a book found around the 700s in the temple. They find the book of Deuteronomy and they come and shout about it. It's in the book of Kings that's described. So they're excusing David because they like David. And they don't want to judge him because they know he did a lot of, you know, sexually uh, adventurous things. Solomon have a lot of wives? Yeah, yeah, but they're not, they don't care about Solomon. They're not interested in Solomon. David's the only one they care about. Just like us today. Since it was not open, Israel from the death of Eliezer and Joshua to the elders who served Ashtarte, and they hid it. And it was not revealed until Zadok arose, wherever that was. But look, as for David, his works will rise up. In other words, we are not going to judge him. God will have to judge him. We, you know, we know David was a little bit remiss in these things, but his works will have to speak for themselves. You see that here? That's what speaks. Except for the blood of Uriah. So they know that was really bad what he did there. What did he do there? Yeah, he put him in the front line and he could get his wife. He said, and God will reckon you there's that God will count it, reckon for him his righteousness. God will reckon them to him. Now these uh, these 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 builders of the wall, these daubers upon the wall, these people, they pollute the temple. Two. So these people care about the temple. And this is how they pollute the temple. They do not separate as prescribed by the Torah, by the law. That is clean from unclean. Pure from profane, holy from profane. But how are they not separating these things in the temple? And here they describe what the problem is. Rather, they lie with a woman during the blood of her parents. And each man takes to wife the daughter of his brother and the daughter of his sister. There it is, almost explicitly. We are in the Herodian period. It's still a temple too, right? Now, hold on. Now, hold on. 
the point is that, well, what are you talking about? This is the temple. These are no priests, no Jewish priests are going to be doing this and doing these kinds of things. Who are you talking about? I think that comes in the next section where they say, you know, whoever approaches them cannot be cleansed. Like in a cursed house, he's, he's, he's guilty unless he was forced. So here's the thing. I don't think any Jewish priesthood was sleeping with the women during their prayers. In this prayer, I don't think anyone would, would say they were, and I'm sure they were scrupulous about those things. But they had contact with people who were, and they were, and they were incurring the pollution of people that were by allowing them into the temple and by taking their appointment of that priesthood from them. So they were taking or involving themselves with Herodian family members who were doing this. And that's why they weren't separating holy from profane. And that's why they were including the priesthood. They were taking their gifts. And they were taking the priesthood. That's where the riches came from. And so there's no indication that the Maccabees were rich. We know the Rhodians were. You got it? I think that's what I may be wrong, but that's all I did. Okay, let me go on here. And uh, So, but Moses said, you shall not approach your mother's sister. She is your mother's near kin. Leviticus. And this is a real innovation here. You see, while the law of incest was written for males, it's now being extended like modern law does. By how does modern law, what's the word they use when they use a, another case? They, um, precedent. Uh, precedent. And by um, analogy. Analogy and precedent. It likewise applies to females. We're getting equality of male and females here and extending the law to the female from the man. Therefore, if a daughter of a brother, like Herodias, uncovers the nakedness of the brother of her father, like Herodias, like uh, Bernice, like Drusilla, like all these Herodian women that I tried to call your attention to, he is near kin, and they pollute their Holy Spirit. Not they, but these people who do, who are letting people do these kinds of things. And open their mouths with a tongue full of insults or blaspheming tongue against the laws of the covenant of God, saying, they're not sure. They blaspheme the Lord. Remember how Jesus, uh, they say, you know, uh, blasphemer, 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 you know, and so on and so forth. This document is yelling out blasphemy too, but against the people who say the laws of the covenant of God are not true. They speak an abomination concerning them. And then we get the John the Baptist imagery of the of the uh, of the fires and the fan ready for the burning when John is presented his teaching in the beginning of Matthew, I think. All of them are kindlers of fire, generation of vipers, and lighters of firebrands. Here it is. Their webs are spider webs their eggs are the viper are the eggs of vipers. They are the offspring of vipers. So generally you are the offspring of vipers. Here it is. It's a different, slightly different, but same phraseology. One is certainly parallel to the other. So this whole generation who do these things, who involve themselves with these polluted people, who take their priesthood from polluted person, from foreigners, from Romans, from Herodians, from others, are all corrupt and polluted. We do not have a pure priesthood here. All of them are kindlers of fire. Whoever approaches them cannot be cleansed. Like an accursed thing, he becomes guilty unless he is forced. For in former times, and here we get God visiting their works, but now visiting for destruction. We had visited at the beginning. God visited the, uh, the earth and caused a root of planting to, come, to grow. Now the visitation is for destruction. And his wrath was kindled. We heard all about how that happened. Uh, and Moses stood up along with Aaron by the hand of the Prince of Lights while Beliel and his godfathers raised up Yannis and John and his brother at the time of the first salvation of Israel. That's in the Exodus. And guess what? In 1 Timothy, Yannis and his brother are mentioned. And it's two magicians in the wilderness. And if you look at 1 Timothy 3, I think you'll find, in fact, they, he even knows the name of the brother, Yannis and Yambres, J-A-M-B-R-E-S. More internal measures for dating. 
In other words, mature written around the same time as 1 Timothy. In any case, I don't need to go into the illusions, just the kind of thing they're saying. And in the era of desolation, <coughs> the removers of the bounds stood up, the people who removed the law let Israel stray, the land was decimated because they spoke rebellion against the commandments of God by the hand of both. Does this group think that, um, that uh, the Mosaic covenant in Sinai is the covenant of Hagar of slavery? No. This group thinks that that's the right covenant. Now, again, I don't say that it is right. I'm saying that's what this group thinks. But God remembered the covenant of the first and raised up from Aaron men of discernment and wisdom and made them listen. And now we go back. We heard about digging the well. Now we're in column six. We're digging the well again. And they dug the well. Now we have a quote from Numbers 21.18. The well which the princes dug, which the nobles of the people dug, dug with the staff, Mahokek is the word in Hebrew, staff. But it also, hok is law, can mean lawgiver. So now we're going to get an analysis of what this prophecy means. And I'm going to we'll just do this quick because I want to link it up with the sons of Zadok we had a moment pre previously. The well is the, is the Torah. In the community rule, the way in the wilderness is going to be called the study of Torah. The well is the Torah, the law. The diggers are the penitents of Israel. Ah, there we have a power. Remember we had penitents of Israel in check column four? Who were they then? They were the priests. Right? Now they are the diggers. And what did they do? Ah, they went out from the land of Judah. It's the same group. So the diggers and the priests are the same. And they're the penitents. That's the key. These are the same two groups. And they go out from the land of Judah to, but something is added, to dwell in the land of Damascus, to sojourn in the, in the land of Damascus. And it's for this reason that, that God called them all princes, because princes was also mentioned in his previous <coughs> passage from Numbers, the princes dug. So they're all princes, because they saw him, and their honor was questioned by no man. This is really very esoteric. And the staff, because that's Mehokek, based on the same word as Hok, law. He is the interpreter of the Torah, the seeker after the Torah. Because they sought God, you see. The seeker, the interpreter. Of whom Isaiah said he creates an instrument for his own work. And so the seeker, the staff, the, the, the interpreter of the Torah, goes out into, the, into this land of Damascus with it. And the nobles of the people are those who came to dig the well with the staves. Now, to my mind, the nobles of the people, go back to the thing, the princes, which the nobles of the people dug, uh, the diggers are the penitents of Israel. So the nobles of the people, to my mind, are the same as the Nilbeam in the previous one. And the Nilbeam with them. And the nobles of the people are going out with them to dig the well. So though they, people, I think there could be, uh, also can be peoples, again, Gentiles, uh, who, who, who are also digging with the state. I may be wrong here. It's the best I can do with it. And uh, the staff, he decreed how they should walk in the era of, of, Israel, of evil. He decreed the laws, if you like. Until the standing up, or the arising, or the resurrection, however you want to put it, of he who pours down righteousness at the end of days, or the your ascetic instead of the more ascetic. More ascetic is teacher of righteousness, this is your ascetic. Now this might be a scribal error, it may be the, the teacher of righteousness at the end of days. In any case, whoever this is, this is what they're waiting for. The end of days, and the teacher, or pourer down, the shower of righteousness at the end of days. Now, I'm going to stop in a minute. We're going to go on at the end of that to the New Covenant land of Damascus in line 19, as you see, to set the holy things up according to the precise specifications, to strengthen the hand of the meek, the poor, the convert, each man seeking the welfare of his brother, and so on. And it also says, to love each man his neighbor as 
which is the royal law of scripture according to the letter of James. So the new covenant letter of Damascus is going to be described at the end of that section, and then we're going to have more about that in column 7 and 8, which I'll cover next time. But I will say that, um, that um, we're getting a view of something is coming at the end of days. We're in the near period of the end of days, and they're expecting the end of days or the last time is very short. We'll finish this, go to the community rule, you're beginning to get a grasp of these people. This is, uh, if, it's, if it's not Christianity, it's the closest thing to Christianity that you can find. The only difference is, it's law-oriented, not faith-oriented. And the Messiah hasn't been emphasized. Yeah. Well, what was that? What's up? I, I can talk now. Go ahead. What do you want to ask?